You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. This is Rod Mahood, your in-game voice of the Niagara Ice Dogs, and you're listening to the Dog Pound Podcast on the Armchair GM Sports Network, your podcast source for all game analysis, team interviews, and up-to-date news regarding the Niagara Ice Dogs. Perlini! Overtime! Ice Dogs win! Hosing! To a kill Thomas. Thomas has the angle coming. Welcome into another episode of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family and all four of their great Niagara region locations. Brandon Caputo and Cam Halbert are with you to discuss the midway point of February for the Niagara Ice Dogs. Cam hasn't been able to uh, be around in a little bit uh, with all of his traveling uh, for uh, his uh, gaming stuff, so we appreciate him being able to come on and uh, discuss kind of a, a little bit about the team here at the midway point of February. They just came off of a couple of big road trips, including the northern road trip in Sudbury, Sioux, and North Bay. We're also going to get post-game comments from head coach Ben Boudreaux following the weekend, just kind of wrapping it up in general, which obviously wasn't the best as far as the results for the Ice Dogs go. But uh, we'll get into some of that uh, on today's show as well. We'll go over the updated lineup. We'll go over the player stats and uh, some records that are probably about to be broken here uh, shortly here for some of this some of these young players on this Ice Dogs lineup. So before we get going, guys, if you enjoy the video version of the podcast, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell for all updates on video versions of our podcast. And thank you to those today tuning in in on demand on whatever audio platform you choose to listen to us. Give us a follow at Dog Pound Podcast on X for all of our Ice Dogs content, and we're available on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all that good stuff for you. So with that said, Cam, I'm just going to kind of open the floor to you here. In the words of Cody Rhodes, what do you want to talk about? Because the Ice Dogs, you know, two weeks ago was a really good week for the team. You look at the results. They came away with five or six points. Gavin Bryant won OHL, you know, Coach Cole Player of the Week. The Ice Dogs were riding high. Kevin He and Ryan Robrick also had great weeks. And then they hit, uh, you know, this little stumble here, especially with guys in and out of the lineup. And the Northern Road Trip is a gauntlet this year with all three of those teams you know, really going for it. So, you know, I'll leave it to you here. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously a, a tough weekend now, 10 points out of a playoff spot, uh, you know, even though that <clears throat> I don't think it was, you know, maybe realistic, but after last weekend, um, it wasn't completely done. We've got, I believe, uh, 13 games remaining on the schedule. If, uh, memory serves close, I believe. I mean, it's in the team. So there's not, it, you know, they, they've got 10 points to make up on Barry. Uh, as Peterborough has completely fallen out of it. Um, you know, obviously with the trades away to Bronson Ride, who we saw a lot of this, uh, you know, with with the back-to-back against North Bay, and as well as like Sobolev and moving on from Zach, uh, you know, I don't know if it was expected to get better, <clears throat> but at some point when you lose some talent for future assets, uh, you're going to go through your stumbles. And there just hasn't been many games like uh, what we saw, well, North, the, the game against North Bay, I guess, from what I'm alluding to, the 12-1 loss. I watched, you know, the first and second period of that game, and um, it was much closer at the third, or sorry, the, at the first period than the score indicated. And we hadn't seen a lot of the, you, you know, the shoulders down, and then they just kind of mail it in. And um, they had an undermanned roster, which they did take care of this past week. So we can maybe, maybe discuss that, uh, which I love to see just for uh, some help for the guys that uh, that have been playing all season. So that's good. Uh, and then a tough loss to Sudbury. And then obviously the, the brutal one against uh, Sault Ste. Marie or uh, Sault Ste. Marie, just because, um, you know, it was, it was a hard fought game in, in, in the three and three. And like you mentioned, pretty, pretty big gauntlet, but Nonetheless, I do want to um, start with some positives. Number one, they officially passed last year's point total, 
which is wild uh, because they are 14, 30, and 6 uh, with 35 points. But last season, again, we've talked about this all year, just how much better they are this year. Um, they have officially passed this last season point total already um, with, with a ton more games to go. So um, that's that's the huge positive there. Some some things that I want to you know take away. I believe they have 17 more games to go. So huge improvement in that aspect to at least close the gap where they're at least an OHL team. Whereas last year, you know, it could be it, it could have been debated. Um, and, and not only that, the we've talked about this a little bit as the season went along, but because they had you know got five or six the prior weekend, it was like maybe they go on a bit of a run here, playoffs maybe. Um, I, I think we have to assume that playoffs are probably not going to happen, but a lot of individual performances that we can now pay attention to as the year kind of. Uh, winds down and I don't think that's uh, that's a small thing I think that there are, are some big achievements here by a lot of the guys um, especially at the top but uh, no I, I think that that's the, something that we can take away again we've talked about it all year this team is far better than last year and what at least this season's roster gives us throughout the stretch whether they win or lose is that there are players and things and stories to watch for regardless if they're you know they're losing or winning right and i think that that's big it's a good thing for the franchise to have for the fan base to at least have something to watch whereas last year it was kind of off the rails you know this is you know no no real hope and nothing really to pay attention to other than you know kevin's uh rookie goal record um as a 16 year old which is going to be broken um but what what about you what 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 how, how are your vibes you know you've been traveling with the team what have your thoughts been and and what are you focusing on going forward for the rest of the year? Well, I think the the biggest thing is the morale is still up with the guys. And I think that mm. is, is based off of the leadership group they have in there. Gavin Bryant is a heck of a leader, um, you know, in the way that he he carries himself. It's just the way that he is. And now that he's been given the C, I think that guys go to him more or they look up to him a little bit more uh, than they would have when he just had the A. But I, I think it starts from the top there and, and from, from Ben, the head coach, and, and with, with the leadership group that they have and, and the, the bright young players like Kevin taking a big step as a leader and a player this year. So I think you look at, at some of those guys and even like Connor Federko, who's played on a great London Knights team his whole career, and now he's finishing off his career here in Niagara, and he does all the, all the dirty work. So if he's doing that as a veteran player, then the rest of these guys have to follow suit because... If an overage player is going out and doing all that type of work, then you know you're you're going to be expected to do that, especially when they have so many 17 and 16 year olds in the lineup, uh, mostly 16 year olds because they they signed the other three this week, which we'll get into. But they had seven 16 year olds playing this weekend, so that was just an unprecedented amount. I think when you have guys like you know Vermeulen and Levin out of the lineup, and Potter has been out for most of the year, and Asadorian was suspended for the first game in North Bay, he finally came back. You know, Chanowski's out now. Why six, you know, a guy that you and I talked about being an X factor on this decor, and he hasn't been available in quite some time now. So when you take all those guys out of the lineup, it just, you know, I would love to see it, it's probably not going to happen. But if all those guys came back, what this team would have looked like all season long if they would have had, you know, 100% of their lineup. I know injuries happen for, with every team, but I feel like with, with the Ice Dogs, it's just been like a revolving door all year long, and we haven't really gotten to see what this full lineup, you know, I guess the potential of what it could have been fully cogged uh, for head coach Ben Boudreaux with his lineup card. No, I mean, absolutely. I would love to see a man of, like, man games lost due to injury this season because I remember I think it was November where they lost half the roster for a 10-game stretch. Um, and obviously, yeah, injuries happened to, to all, all teams and had definitely happened to Barry, which is probably why they're uh, with, um, Bo, Bo Aiki. Yep. But remember, so, so it hasn't ha happened at the top end for the ice Sox, but they're like the very core and important players. Cause I, I mean, and top, I guess is relative because, um, you know, if you would assume Kevin is, is kind of the driver and then you've got, you've got Ryan or Ro Robrick and, and, and so forth, like losing Owen Flores as well would be a pretty big hit. But to be honest, you know, everyone is so important because there isn't that like so far yet. So there isn't that like NHL player, the NHL caliber prospect yet, uh, which is hopefully going to change the summer. Um, and, and yeah, so it makes a big impact and, 
but l- like I said, e- even without the without the roster being full, you know, and and once once Ben Boudreaux took over, they had the, they've had some insane wins against teams that you just would never have expected. Like if, if you could bet on the OHL, like the lines would have been crazy in some of their wins that they've had. Um, and it just goes to show that like I am so excited for next season by watching how this season plays out. Um, I think it's going to be of the last five years. So the essentially the since the 2018, 2019, or maybe it's 1920, the the season that Akil and, and Tomasino got traded going into that year. Um, I don't think there is a season even close to as anticipated in terms of fan, the fan base for Niagara and what expectations are because with a full training camp, and stability in terms of the coaching staff. And then it trickles down. You have Kevin will get drafted. I'm going to put it out there. Kevin. So we have an NHL drafted prospect. Rupert keeps this up. He's, you know, he might be a first or first 90, you know, in the first 90 of the NHL draft in his draft year, you know, and I don't want to put those expectations on him because that, that's, you know, the pressure we saw, you know, how Kevin's season started and maybe, you know, Ryan deals with that as well. But, I think that these guys are definitely talented and you look at like what scouting, um, you know, pieces from, from very high up members in, in NHL uh, media in terms of that. And Rubrik's name has definitely been mentioned. And, uh, you know, we can talk about it now, I guess is his uh, assault on the, on the rookie record um, in, in terms of as a 16 year old and not just as a 16 year old, but, and, and, and an ice dog, he's leading the OHL in goals for rookies with a crop of very talented 17 year olds. And that might just sound like one year, but 16 to 17 year old is a massive difference in the OHL. Um, so I think that that's such a fun thing to watch. And then you go into next season and all the 16 year olds, well, not all of them, but the main, the main core from this year, Frolov, Galianov, Zada and and Robrick now have a full season where they have basically played every game very close to it. Uh, it's going to be so much more fun to watch next season going into it because I don't think it's like they can't lose a couple games or it's already over because that's what it's felt all year. Every game's felt like a playoff game since the since puck drop of the season in London. It has felt like if they lose a game, that's it. The season's done. Um, but I think going into next year, like expectations are definitely a playoff spot for the first time in like four years. And we'll talk about that a little bit with the the player stats camp since you brought it up. Kevin Heen now has a new career high in goals after his 21 last year, which was obviously tying Akil Thomas's franchise record for 16 year old. So he's at 26 now. A couple more over the weekend, including a shorthanded goal, which was a gem. Um, mm-hmm. And then you didn't get to talk about him last week, but he had a great week. Uh, the week before that, the OT winner against Peterborough, he had three goals and six points the, the prior week, 20 shots on goal. He's leading the Ontario Hockey League with 230 shots on goal, which I believe is six or seven ahead of Sam Maye, who was shooting a lot for Peterborough, not as much now that he got traded to Ottawa. But uh, for Kevin, he, I think that's been the message from the coaching staff is you have a shot, use it. And I think that he's being a little bit more you know, strategic with it. Now he's not just trying to go high glass every single time or, or sorry, not going high and then having it roll around the glass, which we talked about the first half of the year, which was a big problem for this team of them just, you know, missing high and wide and, and not getting those rebounds or second opportunities for their line mates. So I think what you've seen from Kevin, he in the last, you know, little bit here, he's got goals in six of his last 10 and he, he's, he has heated up in the second half of the year. As you mentioned, a really you know tough start for him the first month or two in the goal category. But you know when you look at Kevin He, and he's building to what scouts want, he's gaining that feistiness, that bite to his game. He's not going to be the Lady Bing trophy like he might have been last year. But uh, you know if that was awarded in the league, I think he would have got it because I don't think he, I don't think he had many penalties last year. But this year he's really you know, being more aggressive, he's hitting, he's throwing his body around and he's becoming a more, you know, they always say 200 foot player, but you can actually see that Kevin is becoming that they put him out on the, on the penalty kill. And he's got, you know, he's, he's lethal on the penalty kill as well. So when you look at Kevin, he, he's a guy that you look at going into next year when you said he does, you know, get his name called in June that you expect another big jump from him from his second to his third year, because you know, what we've seen in the second half is, is, he needs to continue to be a driver for this team. And Ben Boudreau talks about that needing that X factor player and Kevin, he shows spurts of it. 
And I think it's something that we need to see more of consistently. Robrick might get there as well. But they need those guys to step up as those top-end dynamic players that you see around the league that put up to 80 to 100 points. Uh, absolutely. And, and to put it into perspective, it's really been almost two seasons for Kevin. So we talked about it. About I just did it real quick um, to double-check. In the first 15 games of the season, he had six points. And it was like... But he looked like it was like he trying to do everything one on four, like, you know, using his unbelievable skating and, and, and trying to just pick these crazy angles, um, which he ended up starting to just put in the net because um, he's got one of the most sneaky, good shots in, in the league. And in his last 25 games, he's got 26 points. So it's, you know, a, a crazy difference for him. Um, and that was after that, you know, a lot of, after they trade most of the, you know, the top end uh, players that, that were, you know, over ages, a little bit older, when Sobel and Rod and the deadline. And uh, it's it's been really fun to watch. And you mentioned that he's a two-way player. There's a lot of times where we do recaps where I'll bring up a play that he, if, if it, even if he's not the one to lose the puck, he's able to get back. Like, he's much like Azadorian. Uh, like, I, I've talked about them all. See, there's players that do not stop skating at any stage of of the of a rush or or a, a, a very annoying to play against best way to describe it very annoying to play against uh because you know someone's trying to get it uh, on a rush or a two on one and you'll see a lot of guys back checking where they'll they'll do their strides to try and catch up and if they don't get it by the blue line it's like all right goalie i hope you got it because then i can get to it afterwards kevin's someone that just legs are always moving and uh um, you know, it's been really impressive on the defensive side of things. But as I alluded to, like he had six points for 15 games, which and it looked like, man, this, uh, you know, maybe the expectations of, of him being drafted in his draft year and, and him needing to lead the team after such a strong rookie season. Um, now it looks like, all right, everything's starting to go in for him. And uh, that's huge. And we've talked about it as well since when, since Boudreaux took over as head, co- head coach, isn't afraid to hold him accountable. You know, mm-hmm. like we, we've seen a number of times where after back of the bench, he's getting barked at for a bad play every once in a while. Very rare now, but it, it's not like, you know, it's like it's I don't mean to bring up the Leafs, but like, you know, the core four is pretty much left alone in terms of criticism for the most part. And, you know, the rest of the guys got to pick it up, whereas Ke- that, that's not the case where Kevin's being held accountable um, for any mistakes that he makes. And those are few and far between now. He's been so much fun to watch. And much like I mentioned earlier on in the episode that like it gives fans something to watch. Like I can't wait for him to get drafted this year because it, it, you know, it, it's just going to be a, a really big lift for the team. The ice dogs more than any other franchise in the OHL need a player to get drafted in the NHL to start to rebuild the franchise, because then at least you see other players that come in now there's at least a scout watching Kevin, regardless of the team that he goes to. You know, there they, we've seen a couple times where I mean, Dubis was in was in the Meridian Center watching. Um, oh, name escapes me. Cooper Foster. Uh, yes, exactly. So like that will happen throughout the year, and the more and more that happens, the other guys, you know, that they realize it's possible. This is a team that last year had 33 points, which is unacceptable this season like i said they've got 17 games to go and have already passed last season point total so it's not like a lot of eyes are going to be on them because most of the league thinks that you know the last place whatever but that's not the case though because if kevin was able to get drafted in those circumstances and then you've got ryan you know like bar like uh you know what i mean you watch it we've watched him all season long and it not only is his shot crazy and he shoots a ton uh, which is which is also kind of nuts because Kevin is the leading shooter in the OHL. You have two players that are shooting a ton. It's like who's passing that puck <laughs> because they're both, you know, he's leading rookies by a large margin with 166 shots on goal. I think the next closest is 120, and then you've got you know Kevin leading the league. So it's crazy that you've got two guys just shooting so much. Um, but you know, nonetheless, like he gets drafted, and now you've got two NHL drafted prospects on the ice dogs going into, you know, and it just trickles down, you know, you tr- make a couple trades for some players that, you know, maybe have a year left and you can really see the franchise being rebuilt and uh, taking advantage of their window for sure. We'll quickly go over the, the player stats here, Cam, from this last week. Uh, obviously some of it wasn't pretty, but we did get Rafik Dianov getting on the score sheet, uh, recently signed to a full-time contract, which we'll get into. 
Kevin, he also with two goals, as I mentioned, one of them was shorthanded. Uh, the one in Sault Ste. Marie, that was a thing of beauty, uh, getting his own rebound and pawning it in. Assists, Eric He got uh, got his point there. Darcy DeWatcher, the other player that was just recently signed. Gavin Bryant, Ryan Van Netten also got on the score sheet. I think something that was big this week was Owen Flores, that game against North Bay, you know, two goals late in the first that I think he'd want to have back. That was kind of where that game started to turn. He ended up getting pulled in that North Bay game. Didn't play in Sudbury. That was Charlie Robertson. But then the way he came back in the Sioux game with a 47-49 to saves against that very good Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds team where it could have probably gotten out of hand if it wasn't for the Ice Dog starting goaltender. And we'll hear from head coach Ben Boudreaux about that uh, later in the in our weekend wrap up. But you know he talked about that was might have been Owen Flores' best game of the season, and what they expect from him, you know, on a nightly basis. So for him to be able to have a a, a bounce back performance after getting pulled in North Bay, you know, shows that the Ice Dogs are in good hands when Owen Flores when he's a hundred percent again. He just came back this week uh, after missing a couple of weeks there, so. You know, have the Ice Dogs starter back in the fold, I think, you know, that that's big as well. And to be able to keep a young team in some of these games, maybe they can sneak out a couple of points here against some top-end teams like they almost did against the Sioux Greyhounds. But, you know, I think that was an encouraging sign for me. Absolutely. And we've seen this a number of times where Flores is one of the more emotional guys on the team. He hates losing. And you need that it, on a roster regardless and you know regardless if it's your goaltender whoever it is you need a few of those guys to just absolutely disdain losing and um when it's your goaltender i think that um you know it's a little bit dangerous sometimes because goals aren't always on the goalie right no and obviously if he's letting in a few and you know the play isn't you know d- defensively isn't isn't clean you know that that can be we've seen that um uh, the game where he got pulled and, and kind of gave it to the bench as he's coming off. It's not that he, you know, blames the team if it, things aren't going well. He just wants to see everyone m- like work harder, all of that. And it, it's, it's that game against like Sue St. Marie was just, or the Sue Greyhound, sorry, is just um, more indicative of how he is because, yeah, he gets pulled in that, in that North Bay game, ugly game, and is immediately comes back and just is like, ah, we're going to try and beat the best team and I'm going to put on my best performance. And, um, you know, hopefully he's here next year because I think we'll give him a playoff run. And I think that he is a type of guy in the playoffs would be a great goaltender to have. Um, just because like, like I said, he's a gamer, isn't concerned about, you know, how he's playing and things like that. He just is just competitive and, and it's, it's really fun to watch because without him, this season would be, would have been rough. There's, there was games early on in the season where there was one goal losses where he stopped breakaways and two on O's and stuff like that, where it's just been really impressive. Yeah. I think, I don't think his numbers speak to, to how well he's played this year. And that, that that's a tough thing, right? You look at his numbers and, you know, an under 900 save percentage and, you know, a goals against higher than what you'd expect. But, Again, when when you have a, such a young decor in front of you, and sometimes four or five defensemen playing, and you know he's facing so many, like you mentioned, two on O's or two on ones, odd man rushes, breakaways, like that's stuff that doesn't show up on on your statistics when you're looking at it at the end of the year and saying, well, you know, why were his stats subpar? It, it, you have to look in deeper than that because I don't think many goalies would would have been able to have an over 900 save percentage on this team with the way that you know the, that's absurd. The, Exactly. Like like that to have an over 900 save percentage on a team that's given up, let's see, uh currently um 228 goals against which is actually the second low or second most in the league behind uh Windsor with 252. Um but you know, to have a 900 save percentage, that's that's crazy to me because a 900 save percentage in the OHL is difficult as it as it is. Like that that's a that's a hard number to hit in the OHL. Um, cause it's just a very high scoring league. Um, so, you know, which is what concerns me is because, you know, he's an overager next year and uh, I hope that we give him the playoff run because at some, you know what I mean? He deserves it. Not only that, cause he's last season, anyone that was on the team last year endured a, a really rough time in their career. Um, just because they went for it, they, they, they were trying to get the Memorial cup and they've just made so many trades just trying to grasp at straws. And then by when all, when all was said and done, 
it, it just did not work. And then it was just trying to get the season over with. And then you have, you know, a few guys like Kevin and, and Flores who uh, were just there and endured it. And then this season much better. And um, I just hope we get the playoff run that Flores deserves next year. Like uh, truthfully, because it, seeing him have to do it because they, they aren't able to get a playoff run next year. The, the, he deserves it a hundred percent and he deserves to be the starter, you know? And again, I think that's something else. He, he, he's a driver. He does not want to be a backseat. And again, that might not be viewed as a good thing. I think it's a great thing. Cause you, you know, having someone who's like, okay, with splitting the net, he's like, no, I want to win with me in net. Like, you know, and, and I really hope, and I expect that next season we'll get that. Yeah. And this is a guy that went to Nashville predators main camp and, mm -hmm. you know, experienced what it was like to, to be around a professional hockey team and, you know, maybe give him a little bit more juice of, what it's going to take to get there and he wants the net all the time i mean he went on that iron man streak where he started 14 straight games before mm -hmm. before he went down so you know there's that... it's funny because like I, i've spoken with ohlers in the past that they know they're not getting drafted and they know that after the season's done they'll go to school you know like their career is done they, they go to school they'll, they'll maybe go to college you know while playing hockey uh, but they know for the most part, the professional career is, is is over, and there's a lot, and that's just a that's the reality in 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 all all sports. But they know Flores doesn't strike me as that. First of all, goalies take longer to develop, and we've seen like for example, uh, Benjamin Goudreau, um was a was a higher pick for the Sharks, and is already unsigned. Like you know what I mean? Like it it's it's very um, sporadic. A lot of good goaltenders in the NHL end up being undrafted or, you know, or free agents that, you know, it doesn't happen to later in their career because of size. And then just, you know, happenstance that, that usually doesn't hit Flores strikes me as someone who's not ready to be done, you know? And um, I think he knows that he's talented enough um, to, to continue his career. And again, I think that's important when you have players like that, there's, there's players like Federico would be a great example. he, knows that this is probably his last year playing in the, or his last year playing in the OHL, you know, more than likely isn't going to be an NHL -er, obviously. Um, but you know, comes back to Niagara's home and just plays like is a gamer. Um, you need a lot of that on a team, especially one that's struggling, you know, but it's such a bonus to have guys like that, that are not done in the, and, and not, I don't want mailing it in isn't the right isn't the right term because these guys battle every game and, and but you know you get you get what I'm saying like there's just a motivation where they they're not they're not giving up. Yeah, the resiliency, and we'll get to Ben Boudreaux's mm -hmm. comments about that in uh, the second uh, segment today. So we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back and we'll get the inside the coach's room with Ben Boudreaux. We'll talk about the lineup a little bit and uh, look ahead to the upcoming game. So stay right here. We'll be right back on the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs. Proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family. Pets bring immense joy to our homes, becoming an integral part of our families. But this living, loving experience often requires a little extra care and attention. That's where Global Pet Foods comes in, with owners and staff ready to support you every step of the way. Check out one of their locations today, 3643 Portage Road in Niagara Falls, 160 Highway 20 in Font Hill, or 400 Scott Street and 344 Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family. Proud to sponsor the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of the Niagara Ice Dogs. Are you looking to hire? Let the Niagara Employment Help Center save you valuable time and money by making your hiring process easier. Their services include free job postings in-house and on their website, fill job vacancies quickly and efficiently, access to a bank of potential employees, reduce employment costs, and financial incentives may be available to offset the cost of new hire training. Check out the website at ehc.on.ca or call 905-358-0021 for more information. The Niagara Employment Help Center, helping people find work since 1983. Niagara Golf Lounge features two state-of-the-art indoor golf simulators allowing you to play some of the world's best courses all year round. The perfect place to indulge all season long. Don't worry about getting thirsty while you play around with your friends. Their fully stocked bar offers a wide selection of drinks, appetizers, and a variety of meals are also available to enjoy before, during, or after you play. 
Grab a seat next to the fire in their comfortable sports lounge. Didn't bring your clubs? No problem. They have partnered with TaylorMade to offer you the best rental clubs. You won't want to miss their exclusive NFL and NHL giveaways for the Buffalo Sabres and Buffalo Bills. Located in the Best Western Plus Cairn Croft Hotel, 6400 Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. Visit NiagaraGolfVacations.com to learn more and to reserve your golf bay today. The Niagara Golf Lounge, Niagara's home for golf and sport all year round. JNL Flooring is Niagara's specialty flooring and design company. They take great pride and provide elite customer service and support. With a beautiful showroom, great pricing, and a wide variety of truly unique products, JNL Flooring is your specialty flooring and decor boutique shop. All of their products are environmentally friendly and responsibly produced so you can feel good about your flooring choices. Their goal is to build authentic relationships based on honesty and integrity that they foster with respect and authenticity. Offering a unique and wide range of quality products presented by a knowledgeable and patient team, they simplify the process to make your life easier and to make your home more beautiful. Visit them at 4424 Montrose Road in Niagara Falls or find out more at jnlflooring.com. If you think you can get a better deal anywhere else, you don't know Jack at JNL Flooring. This is Alex Asadorian. Hey, it's Ryan Roberg. This is Ivan Galianov. This is Gavin Bryant. And this is the Dog Pound Podcast. The official podcast of the Niagara Ice Dogs. Welcome back to part two of today's Dog Pound Podcast episode. Brandon Caputo and Cam Howard are back with you. Guys, make sure to follow the podcast on X at Dog Pound Podcast. Give us a like on whatever audio platform you're listening to us right now on demand. And if you're watching us on the YouTube version, hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell for all updates on video versions of our podcast and our post-game coverage that get released here on the network. I want to give a quick plug to our show sponsor, Global Pet Foods, for their Seniors Day, which is coming up uh, at the end of the month here. The last Tuesday of every month, fit, say 15% off your purchase uh, for seniors. You just have to show your, obviously, your uh, your driver's license or some sort of identification. And you get 15% off your purchase at Global Pet Foods, any four of their great Niagara region locations, the last Tuesday of every month. So uh, that's a promotion they have going on throughout the year. So, Cam, uh, we'll quickly, before we get to Ben Boudreaux's comments in Inside the Coach's Room, let's quickly update the lineup and we'll... Uh, discuss a couple of the signings. This was the most recent update or projected lineup in Sioux. So this is up on the video version of the podcast. If not, you can go to our uh, X account at Dog Pound Podcast and you'll see it there. We posted it, uh, post the lineups uh, before every single game. So Kevin He, Gavin Bryant, Matthew Paris was the top line. You had Ryan Robrick, Alex Asadorian, and Ethan Zada on the second line. Evan Klein, Mason Ray, and Ivan Galianov on the third. And then Eric He, William Stewart, and uh, and Rafik Dianov uh, w- was the fourth line. So you had Podolu still out. You had Levin out, Vermeulen. So you put Vermeulen and, and Levin in that lineup because that that's basically, you know, w- we don't really know the situation with Podolu at this point. But uh, with Levin and Vermeulen, if they were able to come in, you know, that you take out probably Eric e and Dianov. And those are all OHL players that you had signed. No, w- before you went and had to sign Eric E. Dianov and Darcy DeWatcher. No, I mean, absolutely. I, and and um, I think that the, what I take away from, from the signing of, uh, of Dianov as well as um, <clears throat> Eric E. And, um, and DeWatcher is that it, reward isn't the right word because um, they've earned it. But um, we've seen that almost every night for the last month, when you look at the lineup card, Niagara is the only team undermanned. And I think that this is a showing to the guys in the room and the coaching staff that they are giving them uh, assistance. Uh, just giving the four, having a fourth line, let's just say like having a fourth line that isn't someone just filling in like Stewart, for example, hopping in uh, for a shift or two. It takes, it takes minutes away from, you know, some of the other guys so they can get a break, you know, and especially on the back end. Right. So we mentioned this, we've dealt with so many injuries and so much time miss and all of that, that I think it's a, it's a good showing to the rest of the franchise that, 
because they could have just not signed, not signed these, not signed these guys and, and carried out the season and, and, you know, gone into next year, but they're not doing that. And we've heard Ben Bergeron's comments about, you know, we, it's hard to play without a full lineup. Right. And, um, I think that going forward again, just sets a good foundation for the, the franchise. And then going into next year, you know, we're obviously going to lose a few overagers because we've got so many, um, but there's a lot more battles at camp and having the full rosters. We saw at the beginning of the year where we thought that the roster was going to be so thin and that it ended up being where we had, you know, three LT scratches and it was, you know, Galliano couldn't get in the lineup and, and it was, and same with O'Flaherty as well. Um, and, and I think that that was great early on just because the, the roster was strong and that injuries hit. I think that this is great to show to the guys that it's not just, Hey, you guys take care of the rest of this. this is a good showing about the franchise that we're still, we're invested. We're going to build this thing. And, uh, it's just another good showing going into next year, I think. Yeah. And you mentioned about the decor as well. Another game where they had to ride with 5d because, uh, Chinowski was battling something. So. Uh, they'll hope to have him back this week, but we'll we'll see where that goes. But when when you don't have Wysik in there and Chanowski, you add those two guys in there, and it, it's a pretty good decor in my opinion because that's probably your top pair: is Chanowski, Wysik. You move Padrekar and Van Netten or Federko, Frolov, like however you want to structure the the decor there with the Watcher as the extra. Like to me, that's a pretty solid decor for what they they've kind of gone through this year, and and we've talked about how how excited we were about Andrew Wysik and Chanowski taking another big step as as a puck-moving defenseman on this team that he really never had that opportunity in Brantford and now being back home here in Niagara, it's come full circle for him. But I, I think like if you had all those guys there at your disposal, we'd be looking at a different team and maybe a different uh, outlook on, on where they are in the standings right now because you know when, when, you, when you lose that many guys and it's just been a revolving door all season long and then Levin gets you know hit up high and... And you're just you're trying to scramble for depth all season long, and you're doing all these call ups, and you know we we've seen he and Deanov and DeWatcher throughout the season, but now they're they're going to be full timers now. But we've seen even like Kulikovs and other guys called up that you know we we wouldn't have even expected to have a spot in this team this year. But like you mentioned, they need to have bodies to give the other top guys a rest here. Well, I I, I, mean, I do want to say this. I think that their decor has been the one thing that is for the first like up till. Maybe up until the Christmas break, I thought their decor. I mean, they've rarely missed anyone on the decor. When it was Sobolev, Ride, um, uh, as well as uh, Wysik and and Frolov and Federko, and, uh, and Federko. I'm missing who's the six? Right, I named six there. And Wysik and that was out. And Wysik, yeah. So w- w- their defense, for the most part, was pretty sound. I mean, Frolov and and uh, Sobolev played together exclusively for like the first half of the season. It felt and it they were losing games like two one, right? Like that, that you, that was a playoff level defense decor. And while they had to move ride and Sobolev and we're going to lose Federko, obviously, because he's an overager. Oh, wait. Yes. The overager. I always mix it up. <clears throat> so going into next year, you've got Padre car, Frolov, Wysik, uh, as well as Chanowski. If you go and you move like, we've always been doing these trades for the last couple of years because we're rebuilding where it's like our best player for a couple pieces and draft picks, right? It's never all of our stuff for an NHL prospect defenseman. Like, I think that we we've, we've mentioned this before when it comes to power play and stuff that we haven't had a guy that just absolutely bombs it from the point. And I think that's the big thing that, that that's missing from, from, from the team, one of the few, right? But, I don't think drafting like uh, again. I'm going to put my GM cap on here. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be armchair GMs. Nice plug. Um, <laughs> I think the team still needs far more offensive players. I think that you know Rubric was a like if you're gonna redo that draft, do you think that Erie takes Rubric? I don't think so. Really? Still, you think they went with? They still think they go with Schaefer? Yep. I feel like he's had a quite much quieter year. No, Rubric to me has had a better year than than Schaefer, but. Just as as far as taking a, a D that they think will develop, I think they'd probably still go with Schaefer, but I think it's a lot. I closer. guess they have more offensive weapons. They do yeah. have more offensive weapons than what the Ice Dogs have. So, but okay, that was a that was a, a bang on pick. They did not like anyone below him. I think they, it it would be argued that it would be hard to argue that you would pick someone over Rubric at two. 
Um, I think they need to go. They're going to get another high pick. Maybe they get first, right? Because the odds are the exact same when it comes to the four teams that miss the playoffs. Um, they need to take another forward there. And I think that we've seen that a 16 year old forward can be, is more than likely more impactful than a 16 year old defensive. It's very hard for a 16 year old defensive, which is so crazy. Why Frolov has been what Frolov has done. So getting another impact forward high in the draft, then going into next season with Kevin now drafted Robrick is going into his draft year where it looks like he is a top 90 pick in the NHL. Uh, you've got Galliana who's been great as a 16 year old. You've still got Bryant and, and Zada again and, and, and Ray. And you can see that the forward and Asadorian, um, you can see the forward core is pretty strong at that point. You trade your assets for a playoff run for an NHL cal or not even an NHL caliber, but a top OHL level defenseman. And you can see this team is not that far away from being really strong or at least a guaranteed playoff team. I think that's what the fan base and the organization craves is stability as a whole, but going into the year being like, yeah, pencil them in the top eight in the East, right? That's where we want to be, right? We, our cycle of being out of the playoffs is over. We're, we, that's not acceptable next year, in my opinion. Uh, for the fan base, management, all of it. I think that they all, are, everyone is in agreement in that. So I think that going into next year, if they can make those trades um, for a big time defenseman, that's that would be that would be huge. Um, you know, but we'll have to wait and see. I, I think that I would I would be pretty stunned if they don't go forward. But maybe I'm wrong, just because of the timeline. We've got Kevin for two more years, mm -hmm. right? Like Robrick, we've got three. You've got like your bang on top, like. That that is the nucleus of what you build around for your cycle before then you have to you go all in, push your chips in like Windsor did, and then you do it again, right? But I think they want to get to a point where it's like, let's not do that. Let's not have our two year window all in and then back out of the playoffs again. I think they want to get to a spot where it's like, hey, even if we are having a down year, we're still in the top eight. Yeah, and we're gonna have lots of time to talk about that when we hit our draft coverage and and, and draft season. It's Let's gonna be that. gonna be really exciting uh, for that uh, that time period. And again, hopefully, we're not talking about picking in the top five like you said next year because I think uh, you know this will be the third year in a row they picked in the top two. So um, depending on how the lottery kind of shakes out there, but uh, we'll we'll talk about that uh, as we move forward. But but I want to get to head coach Ben Boudreaux's thoughts here. So then we have time to, to talk about it before we look at the upcoming game. So here is Ice Dogs head coach Ben Boudreaux and inside the coach's room recapping the last week of games for the Niagara Ice Dogs after a very tough northern road trip, 3-3 three and three in North Bay, Sudbury, and Sioux. Fine work in Niagara since 1983. Coach, uh, thanks for taking the time. I, I know it was a, you know, a, a tough weekend as far as the travel goes, but also the results for the team. Um I'm just going to kind of open it up to you, general assessment on, on the weekend that, you know, it got better as the week went on as far as the results. I mean, you, you still came away with no points, but um, the 12-1 loss in North Bay, then 6-1 in Sudbury, and then a really hard-fought game in Sioux last night, losing by one goal to, to three really tough teams this year. How would you kind of assess the whole weekend? Well, um, we knew uh, what the challenge was going to be in North Bay, uh, beating them back-to-back -back games. Uh, with their former goalie, that's that's a very good hockey team over there. And obviously, when you look at the trade deadline, that's a team that acquired pieces to try to make a push. You know, and losing to a last place team two games in a row, we knew that they would have a lot of pride, and uh, they really poured it on for 60 minutes right from the puck drop. And um, you know, we we just weren't in a position as a team. Like we they they caught us in the first period, and we couldn't catch our breath. And um, you know, they they really poured it on to six goals in the second period, and so that was uh, a complete unacceptable effort uh, from everybody involved in that game I thought we gave up which um, you know we've we've been singing their praises all year about the resiliency and battling all the way to the end and that was a one-off for us much like I wouldn't even say one-off because that's happened in Kingston before so um, you know as we uh, got into Sudbury and the next day we all know how good of a hockey team uh, Sudbury can be. And so, you know, three goals in the first and two in the second. And, you know, I think we were 20-something seconds away from tying the third. So, I mean, at least our effort level, not giving up, battling all the way to the third is is uh, was something important. And then you go into the Sault Ste. Marie uh, or against Sault Ste. Marie, and arguably that's the best team on paper. And uh, that was their first game of the week. And, and just from from the opposition, standing behind the bench, seeing Sault Ste. Marie, that team um, – 
throw this into the ground shift after shift after shift, knowing that we were on the road playing three and three. Um, I thought they threw everything at us, and I have a ton of respect for the way Owen Flores found a way to bounce back and battle and give us a chance all the way to the end. I mean, if it wasn't for him, we would have been out of it. But, uh, you know, we had an opportunity to tie up the game, I think, in the last 10, 15 seconds there, which is all you can ask for from a goalie, give you a, give you a chance to play. And um, a very, very good Sioux Greyhound team found a way to beat us by one goal, even though the shots were lopsided. That's, uh, you know, for us, uh, the way we showed up to the game and battled, um, I thought was, uh, you know, a really important thing that we just didn't pack it in. And, you know, I used the word playing with pride quite a bit over the last two games because I didn't think there was any resemblance of that on the first game versus North Bay. And you talked about the lineup a little bit. You haven't been able to have the 12 forwards and 60 in a while. And, and it, again, it's been a revolving door there. You lose Chanowski after the North Bay game. Uh, a couple of guys didn't end up making the trip that uh, you were hopeful would. Uh, you signed the three uh, call-up players that have, you've had throughout the year in Deanna, Eric Key, and, and Darcy DeWatcher uh, before the week started. Just speak to um, you know those three guys coming in and not an easy situation going up and running the gauntlet against three really good teams this year up north and uh, you know just being able to fill the spots because you guys, the reality is you just need bodies right now and, and those guys were able to step in there. Yeah, we need bodies and hats off to them. They found a way to get on the score sheet, all three of them. AP's, uh, you know, now signed, found a way to combine for a goal, which was big. Diana have now two goals. Um, but the one thing with, with our APs this year is we haven't had a chance uh, to practice with them. We had all three of them at practice the day before we left, which I think was big. Um, and just from a coaching standpoint, it's unfair uh, to them to place expectations on them to carry us uh, through. They're, they're there to help alleviate some of the minutes that our, our top guys are playing. And, you know, I thought they did an admirable job, especially when the game got out of hand. We started getting them more minutes, uh, trying to get acclimated to play and, you know, with pace and uh, the expectations in the OHL. So, um, you know, that that's, uh, that was a great uh, thing from them, you know, finding a way to battle all the way to the end. And, you know, the fact that we were in a game 2-1 um, in Sault Ste. Marie, I don't think they saw a lot of ice time. And um, they're still there being supportive. So uh, you got to give give them credit for guys stepping in more than halfway through the year, trying to trying to fill a purpose on the roll. we got to got to give them a couple stick taps to uh, join us on the, the road trip, a tough one at that. And it wasn't all on him, but the 12-1 game was obviously not what Owen Flores was looking for. You made the goalie change halfway through that game, got Charlie Robertson in, gave him the night off in Sudbury, and then he came back uh, with a great performance against the Sioux Greyhounds team, making 47 of, of 49 saves last night. Can you just speak to the performance of him being able to battle back as your starter? Because you've talked about this year that you were, you were going to ride him you know, when he was back in the lineup. And, and just, uh, I guess a team like that, it's nice to see a performance. Would you say that that's probably, you know, one of the better performances you've seen out of your starter all year? Yeah, I mean, that might be one of the better performances from any goalie on any team this year in the OHL. I mean, he, he was nothing short of incredible, obviously, for a visiting team to go into a barn against uh, the Greyhounds and come away with the first star. It was recognized by the media, which... I think goes a long way, but even more so as an individual uh, for Flores, we've spoken about the confidence that we have in him, and when he gives us a game like that, you know that he's going to be a very capable goalie, and as far as an OA, um, if he's got the help and the team uh, in front of him, I mean, I think he's going to be a stalwart on the back end, so um, for for us right now, and, and in the position that we're in, he's doing everything he can to battle for us, and his attitude, and his uh, is is a never give up one, never never say die, and he's a, he's a warrior, and we need that right now, especially with 17 games to go. And you're very honest and, and upfront about you know where the team is right now, and despite having a weekend like that, uh, you know where you pick up no points. What are like what's your biggest takeaway? You know, from that weekend, is it you know Kevin He getting a couple more goals, getting one shorthanded? Is it the penalty kill? You know, going six for seven. Like, are there things that you're going to take from this as you move into next week, which is going to be a short week because you play in Erie on Wednesday, to kind of you know not use it as a complete wash and throw away, but learn some good things from it and and you know take some positives from a weekend like that. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things when you look at our team, there's only one graduating player that's not going to be here, and Feds uh, is playing a ton of minutes for us, and, you know, we'll obviously miss him, but we have a group that's going to be together next year, so I think that's really important that we're putting our guys in position to develop uh, and learn what it takes to win hockey games when, when we are in those positions, so... 
Um, we only scored three goals on the weekend, one every single game. And, you know, our leading scorer found a way to score two or three of those. So it's he's being consistent in the draft here, and we need that from Kevin, especially battling through injuries. So, I mean, if if there was a bright spot, that would have, would have been the one is that our guys, uh, you know, our player that is expected to score, Kevin He, at a young age, is continuing to do that. So um, I think that's, that's uh, a really important thing. And then at the same time, you look at the court, guys that are playing a ton of minutes you know it's it's uh the the rubrics and the zadas and the galianos and throw off who i thought he had his his best game you know our 16 year olds are you know going to find a way to have an impact uh next year even as young kids but the minutes they're playing right now is going to help them in the development for next year so you know even though it's a loss that the minutes and the exposure of understanding what it takes to be able to compete and what what is needed to be able to play against a an older team that's ready to go for it, like the Greyhounds. I think that's real world first hand experience that you can't get anywhere else right now. So although we're losing, there's gotta be a benefit and a, you know, a positive thing to take away from it. And knowing that we've got a plan, you know, for the future uh, to develop these guys and we you know, at the trade deadline, I thought we did a good job of restocking the cupboards for picks for years to come. You know, it's gonna allow us to get some good young players to support them. Um, so you know, in the future, we don't end up like this. This is back-to-back years with Niagara limping to the finish, not enough bodies to get into the lineup, and, you know, nobody wants to have that next year. So our plan is it's pretty clear-cut in, in order to sell off a few assets at the deadline, which you saw in Sobolev and Lavoie and Crane and Ride, and, and find a way to build around them in the draft. And in the meantime, use our young guys in the minutes right now to develop so we're not in this position for next year. So... Um, although there's growing pains right now, um, you know, one of my sayings that I, I say right now is if you want the sunshine, you got to put up with the rain. And uh, right now there's some, uh, you know, storm clouds over, over the Niagara ice docks, but uh, one day they're going to go away. And lastly, as what's the message to the guys as we move forward here into this week? Because it's a long week. You start early on a Wednesday, you play Friday, you play Sunday, and then quick turnaround on a Monday game for that family day in Oshawa. So what's the message to the guys? And, and obviously hopeful that a couple of the guys you were missing are going to come back in the lineup. But uh, just kind of outlook on a big four-game week, week, up, up, week upcoming. Yeah, I mean it's a good it's a good showcase for these young guys to jockey for position to see where they're gonna uh, fit for next year. I mean there's there's gonna be new faces in the lineup, and just because you're playing a second line, first line, or third line role right now doesn't mean it's gonna be handed to them for next year. So, you know, if you get an audition on the power play like Frolov did this weekend, or Podrakar is running the first unit, you want to see them take some steps and take some strides to be able to show you that they're capable of doing that, you know, long term for you. So um, right now there's auditions and roles for our young guys. And, and now is the time to make mistakes and understand what you can and cannot do. Because uh, when there's games on the line and, and you're, you know, you're playing for something as far as jockeying for playoff position and, and really trying to win, that's the time you don't want to make those mistakes. So if I'm a young player in the lineup right now, you're play, kind of playing with house money as far as getting out there and, and developing as a young player, you know, make that move or find out what you can or cannot do. Uh, Cause when the games uh, really mean something as far as, you know, uh, playoffs or, you know, making the difference, one mistake here or there can uh, mean that you're in or you're out. I mean, you know, those are, those are tough moments to make decisions. In. And right now it's a 12, one game or, you know, five, nothing or whatever it is, you get a chance. I mean, you know, let's see what they can do right now. So, uh, right now, it's all about the, the youth movement for us, and until they get older, let's uh, try to develop them the best we can. There was Ice Dogs head coach Ben Boudreau and Inside the Coaches Room brought to you by the Niagara Employment Help Center, helping people find work in Niagara since 1983. Check out their up-to-date job board at ehc.on.ca to find your next work opportunity today. Cam, a lot of good thoughts there from the Ice Dogs head coach. I'm going to let you kind of talk about it here before uh, we kind of wrap up. Yeah, no, I think uh, first thing that I caught when, when he was discussing uh, the three new players uh, joining the team, said it wasn't fair to come in for the weekend. I think he said they had one practice uh, before they left, so uh, not really fair to place expectations on them immediately, um, you know, as they've come in late in the season, and not to mention go on that really rough road trip, uh, not just from the result standpoint, but three very, very good teams. Um, so that's, that's something that, um, you know, in terms of just setting realistic expectations, it'll be good to see the rest of the year. The thing that I'm most excited about in all of that is again, from, I'm speaking for as a fan, but, uh, this, this franchise has just lacked stability over the last three years. And something that he knows is that, you know, he's got stability in, in terms of the coaching staff with management that 
this group, he mentioned this a number of times, the group that that's together right now, um, working towards developing for next year, um, talked about uh, that next year in the roster that they're battling for spots, not just for the renters of this season, but for next season as well. So he talked about Padrakar, uh, you know, running the power play and, and things like that. And that's going to be big because they know that next year they're going to be better. And um, I think that it drives competition for guys on the roster that, again, it's not just getting the season over with and getting on to next year that, Boudreaux has shown that he will hold everyone accountable. We just talked about how he holds even Kevin when when he when he struggles. That um, he's not going to allow players that don't have a great performance at the end of this season. He's not going to forget about that, um, which which is great. And I don't think that you know the coaching staff is going to allow that at all. So um, that's pretty big. And then not only you know just having them now to, to help out with the guys finishing off the rest of the season. Um, it'll be interesting now going to training camp that there's there's battles. There's, there's there's fewer roster spots. It's you know you're not guaranteed top line minutes just because you were in the top six this year. Like it, you're, you're they're working towards next season already, uh, which is great to hear as opposed to just trying to get the season done. Yeah, and I mean he talked about those young guys kind of stepping in there, the seven sixteen year olds, the the three that they just recently signed there, and. You know, some of the young guys taking bigger steps, like Frolov getting some power play time now and, mm -hmm. you know, starting to showcase, like you mentioned, that that those guys that are going to be, you know, what they are going forward into next year, but they still have to remain in the moment now when there's 17 games left in the season. And, you know, they, they still think that they have a, a shot at this, but I know there's a, there's a long-term play here uh, more so than just making the playoffs this year. But, you know, if they did go on a, on a run here where they were able to kind of sneak back into somewhat of a discussion here, sitting 10 points back of Barry with a big four game week coming up. Like, I think it's just big for them. Like you mentioned, I think earlier in the year, just to be playing meaningful games down the stretch. And to me, they're still playing in somewhat meaningful games because until yeah. they're mathematically eliminated, they're technically still in the hunt here. No, no, absolutely. And, and again, if they go on, like we haven't, we've seen little stretches where they've had four game runs where they go three Oh and one or two Oh and two. We just haven't seen like a five game win streak that that's what's missing, right? Like if they, it, you know, and that's within the realm possibility for sure, because the team has beaten every good team in the OHL so far. Um, so it's definitely within the realm possibility. I'm, I'm curious, what are, what would you like to see um, in terms of roster construction or, or something uh, for the rest of the year going into next year for certain players? Like give me something that you would like to see. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'd love to see Rubrik be center for the rest of the year. Um, just to see because I think he's destined to be a centerman, it just based on his size. Um, but give me give me something that you you would like to see. I can't really pick one thing, but you just piqued my interest about Robrick because he's sitting 19 goals. He's two away from tying Kevin He's record. I think by the next time that you're on a show, that w would you say that uh, that Ryan breaks that uh, that Kevin He and, and Akil Thomas 21 year old or 16 year old record with 21 goals. I, I I could see it next game. Like he's already had his hat trick game. Like it, 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 he scores in bunches and he shoots so much. So it could be like next game, right? I don't think it's going to take very long. I think it's inevitable, unless something you know, knock on wood, something happens the rest of the season. But it will be broken. What's the actual rookie record? Twenty seven yep. by um, Anthony yeah. Not, that's sure. what's funny is that's not completely out of reach either. You know, like he is he's really come alive, and um, it would be such a good story if he was able to do that. Um, but yeah, like that's something that I would just like to see. Cause when, 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 Boudreau, what Boudreaux said about, you know, Padrakar on the, on the power play and things like that. Um, those are things that I'm like, okay, that would be kind of cool. Um, just, just, uh, you know, giving, giving guys opportunities like that. I'd like to see Galianov. Like, I think he's a centerman too, just because he's so feisty defensively, but I'm wondering if he'd be a, you know, winger on up, up higher in the lineup. You know, he's he's actually sneaky, he had decent a decent offensive season. I think he has 17 points in 44 games, and the majority of those games, he's on the third or fourth line this year. He's had some spells where he's been way higher in the lineup, but I think that that was due to injury and, and reward that, that you know, for, for a decent game. Um, and then finally, I want Zada in every situation possible on the top unit power play, on the top unit penalty kill, second line center, you know, which makes it difficult because Brian is probably is is the best center. Well, I mean, I even asked Dorian. It's, it's tough when everyone's healthy, right? But if you're working towards next year, uh, those are the things that I want to see. Because if Zada isn't going to 
be the point producer that rubric is. And that's not saying that, that it isn't a lot of OHLers in their first six, in their 16 year old season have a, you know, Kevin had what 35 points in his rookie season. Mm hmm. Right. So it's not like, you know, it, oh, the book's done. He's not going to be an offensive player, but he definitely looks like he's got some snarl and and defensively a little bit more um, responsible. So I would love to see him just tested for the rest of the year in that aspect. But you mentioned that like the season still isn't over. So you can't just do that and, you know, results be damned because you're right. If they if they go four game win streak right now. That's I would love to see it. It'd just be so much fun. But I, I got to give them props because the whole season we said, let's just not be eliminated by November. And they haven't been. So, And we'll wrap up here with the upcoming games for the Ice Dogs. I mean, it's a big four game week here, uh, as we mentioned. And, you know, what are you looking for from this from this week? They got a short week, Erie. Then they play Oshawa. Then you've got uh, Sunday against Brantford. And then back on a, on a Monday family day in Oshawa. So realistically, out of the possible eight points, what are you hoping to see from this team? God, just beat Brantford. I don't know what <laughs> it is this year, but God, that team is just so annoying. It, you know, to watch, in a good way. Like they, we we talked about this that they are going to be one of the hardest playoff teams to go up against because you know might not have like, I mean, they have a good offense, but like they just man, every line just has that guy. You know, that is just annoying to watch as a fan. So uh, I would love for them to just beat Brantford. Cause what's that streak at like 10 games that they've lost to them? 20. I think it's at 21. Yeah. Which is uh, enough, you know, like I would, <laughs> I would love to see that. Um, you know, they've done very well against Erie this year. Um, that That's if, if the playoffs, if we want to actually talk about like, they have to beat Erie. Um, absolutely. And then they've got the two games against Oshawa who, um, you know, fourth in the conference, but the Eastern conference is much weaker than the West, like by quite a bit. So fourth in the East is not, you know, doesn't have as much weight as, as it has maybe in past years. So it's not like they aren't winnable games. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's awfully tough that I just would love to see them beat Brantford. I think that's the, the takeaway I have out of these next four, just <laughs> play your playoff game against them. I, I want to see them be beaten. So Erie, you want the two points in Erie, and then hopefully, that has to happen. That that has to happen. Yeah, yeah. and the Oshawa is going to be tough because they've been playing very well as of late, and this is the first time we're seeing Oshawa this year, and it's going to be you know two times in in three days there, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, and there's not really any uh, non playoff teams left. Like I mean, they've got Barry, uh, I believe, twice. Peterborough um, again, and Peter. Oh, they do have Peterborough once, but the majority are just playoff teams. Um, so yeah. we'll see, but you know, I think that that's something that I would love to see them. God, they've just beat, they've beaten Kitchener and, and, you know, and, and Ottawa and like, it's just beat the, beat the teams that are struggling. You know, I would love to see, it's almost like they play up to their opponent. Right. Like, and I would just love for them to hammer home. Um, uh, like they did with Kingston earlier in the year, you know, for example, I would just love to see them put away the teams that they absolutely have to put away if they want to be a playoff team, even not this year, but even next year. Well said. Well, Cam, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you in a few weeks, but thanks for doing this and uh, look forward to Ooh. your returns to the game recaps. Absolutely. Great job uh, covering the game recaps, and thanks for everyone for listening. That's going to wrap up another episode of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods and their four great Niagara region locations where pets are undeniably part of the family. Thanks to those watching today on the YouTube version. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, smash that bell. And thank you to those today listening in on-demand audio and as well give us a follow at Dog Pound Podcast for all of our Ice Dogs content and all of our updates there. I spoke to Ice Dogs alumni Jason Robertson last week in Buffalo. That article is live on our website, armchairgmsports.com, if you want to go and take a look at that talks about his time with the niagara ice dogs now a superstar with the dallas stars so until next time for cam halbert my name is brandon caputo we're signing off here on the armchair gm sports network and we'll talk to you again very soon you're listening to the armchair gm sports network